thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be home. And uh, it's been a few years, but I did live um, in Sandy Mount in the 1980s. And when you were saying those words, I thought, dang, you think <laughs> engineering is a chauvinist call, uh, is great to be a chauvinist engineer too. I thought, wow, I knew we were on the same page. And I've always felt that when I've come home, that it truly is a coming home. Mr. Chairman, you said something about uh, history, and it's true that on my father's side, I'm a third generation engineer, and uh, a bit about on my mother's side. So my mother was born of Irish immigrants who came to the U.S. in 1908 and 1909. And where they uh, ended up living in New York, my mother used to tell a story of growing up without electricity and what that meant, especially being a young girl and not having any electricity in the tenement homes and coming to an apartment when it was dark. And I recognized since that time the importance of energy, particularly to safety and safety of, of women. And so um, I think that really informs why I feel so fortunate to be in this position and to serve the country and the president as Undersecretary of Energy. Uh, my father coming from electrifying his communities and seeing what that meant for people in the community, and my mother coming from a community that didn't have electricity and seeing the impact on that. I think something else that informs my general approach, and we had a conversation before this, was about the importance of, of a, an expression that they both learned growing up in the Depression, which is want not, waste not. And so one of the things that I find very difficult is just wasting energy as well, and that informs some of the things going forward that we need to do in order to hit our administration's goals for a new clean energy economy. So with that as a, a bit of introduction, I'll say a few words now about the history of energy. Quite in interestingly enough, until the 1880s in the U.S., the major source of, of energy, primary source was wood. And then after the 1880s, um, coal, hydropower came into uh, being. And that held forth for about 70 years, and then you saw with the uh, increase of the automo automobile for transportation, oil. And oil has held rain for the last 70 years. And this is an area where there are many connections in between Ireland and the U.S., myself being one of them, obviously, uh, but also our dependence on petroleum, and in particular imported petroleum. And looking at the U.S., we import about 300 billion worth of petroleum, about 300 million people, so that's roughly $1,000 per person. Uh, I've read that Ireland imports about 6 billion worth of petroleum, roughly 4 million people, so about 1,000 euro, <laughs> roughly. So we have, um, in our goals that we've set with the administration, energy security, improving our economy, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions that address, in part, this imbalance in the trade of energy. So I would like to say a few words about the energy goals that our president has set and what we're trying to do about them in order to tee up a, a bit of a conversation in Q&A. Uh, first thing that I looked at is, well, what if we're going to hit the president's goals of 42% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, how hard is this going to be? So if you look at our energy consumption, Currently, 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels, 15% from non-fossil fuels. To reduce that and fossil fuels leading to uh, CO2 emissions, to reduce that by 85% means that we have to flip that so that we have 85% of our energy come from low carbon. Now, it may start out as some carbon source originally. It could be biomass, it could be coal, could be natural gas, but we need to find a way to capture, reuse, store, or otherwise mitigate the emissions of CO2. And 15% then could come from uh, carbon intensive operations, which probably will be mainly in the industrial sector. So that's a big challenge to go from 85 15 to 1585 over the next four decades. The primary sources of energy would centuries. Coal, 70 years, oil, 70 years, now we have 40 years. And of course, if you look at the learning curves and adoptions of technologies, that can take 20 or 30 years by itself. So we're really looking at what's going to happen over the next 10 years and seeing how that can be deployed so that we hit our goals. When you start to back it up, when I first came in, I thought 2050, that seems like a long way off to be setting goals. And then once again, I, I saw the wisdom of our leader 
because when you back it up, it turns out that we need to utilize the technologies that can be developed in the next 10 years, uh, hopefully during the two terms of this administration, which means that, therefore, the budgets that we start teeing up now, which extend out over a period of time, are crucially important. And that's what I've been spending a lot of time on, is trying to understand what should the government's role be in terms of funding R&D, the research and development, but also demonstration and deployment. And that is going to differ for different technologies. If you look at, at uh, solar technology, we're probably on the seventh generation of solar technology. So it is being swept into the market, uh, mostly by how fast we can reduce the cost. And historically, the, as the volume doubles, the cost drops by 50% or more. So that's a much later in the learning curve technology. It's now about just driving down cost. On the opposite side of that is carbon capture and sequestration, where we're just demonstrating the first plants at scale today. And we pro probably will need two or three generations so that we can learn how to carry out the carbon capture and storage uh, at low cost, so that then the market will bring the capital from off the sidelines and deploy it. So different technologies, we need a portfolio, is the first thing recognized, to hit the President's goals, again, of the greenhouse gas emission reduction, generating a clean energy economy, and then providing for our energy security. So in terms of the status, we know we're in an 85, 15% world. But to make it even harder, the US consumes 20% of the world's petroleum, and we have 2% of the world's resources. So conservation, reducing the amount we use, and finding other ways to transport ourselves uh, besides petroleum. And that's, that is challenging, because petroleum is a very energy-intensive fuel. It travels well. You can go many miles on a gallon of gas. So um, there's a reason that we import the $300 billion worth of this kind of petroleum. Now you might say, well, how is the energy use distributed across the, um, uh, the country? About a third of it is in transportation. About more than a third is in buildings, actually roughly 40%. So the energy that we use in the residential buildings and commercial buildings, of which 70% is in electrical generation, 30% in heating. And then the balance, which is roughly a third, a little less than a third, is for industrial purposes. So if you think about buildings, transportation, and industry, that's our, our biggest challenge, is that we see a path, fairly straightforward path, through a portfolio of technologies to decarbonize our electrical sector. We have nuclear, we have hydro, we have biomass, we can do clean coal, solar, wind, other renewables. We, we don't have the same portfolio for personal transportation. And the US, we've been in love with the automobile since its invention at the first turn of the last century. So it's that independence, be able to go anywhere, anytime, any place. And certainly, I think that's also the, the uh, allure of the internet, is connect with anybody, anytime, in any place. So, our focus then, in terms of setting a strategy for achieving the President's goals, is to think about, well, first, what will business as usual be? If we do nothing, the U.S. right now consumes about 100 quads, which is just a measure of energy, uh, quadrillion BTUs, just remember 100. If we do nothing by 2050, an extrapolation of the Energy Information Administration within the Department of Energy would say we would be out at about 125 quads of energy use. So our first strategy is to push energy efficiency very hard and try and keep our energy consumption constant. I often think of um, the, the visualization of in, in a great gymnast who sticks the landing, right? Well, we need to stick our energy consumption at 100 quads. So that's the first strategy. How do we do that? Well, we look at where we can get the most savings, and it's in a couple areas. First of all, in buildings. We've, we've, been, we've invested about $12 billion in energy efficiency with the stimulus funding over the last year. That will go on for another couple of years. And the goal there is to try and reduce the energy use uh, by somewhere, um, well, we know what can be um, done. In our pilot studies, we've seen savings of over 30% from just doing a couple things. One is replacing inefficient, inefficient furnaces, caulking and insulation. Windows would be the next. We lose a lot of energy from the envelope, if you will, which makes sense. I, in, energy efficient windows are coming down in cost. Uh, they probably need to hit some sort of parity before they'd be widely adopted. 
and we're not growing our stock like we did at one time. So installing new windows, which they've, the regulations and building codes have gone up since the old windows were installed, we need to have some sort of incentive, some sort of motivating force, if you will, to, to capture the, the next big piece of energy efficiency. Another piece is to give people information about when they use energy, how much is it costing them, and that if you are one to put on an air conditioner, especially if you happen to live in Washington, D.C., in a very hot part, or, or New York today, it was 103 degrees, that at the same time you could turn off or turn down the refrigerator without losing any of the food, but you would use the same amount of energy to be more comfortable. And it's about how do we maintain the same comfortability but use a lot less energy. So that's been one focus, energy efficiency, about $12 billion. And the challenge there is we've set a goal to weatherize over a million homes in the next year between ourselves and, and the housing and urban development agency. We have 150 million, 140 million in that range of homes. So it's really a matter of scale, which we were talking about, and how do we get to scale? I want to say a few words about that later. So the first thing is energy efficiency. The second thing is we must decarbonize our transportation sector. And I applaud the, the goals that have been set by ESB to do that by 2035. I understand, which would be great. Once we decarbonize the electrical sector, then can we use electricity in some form, whether it's uh, going through electrolysis to create hydrogen for a hydrogen fuel cell car, or it's going through to energize an electric battery and electric powertrain in order to have an electric car. That has to be the focus, is getting at the transportation nut. So a couple things, if we were to reduce uh, just the miles traveled, by one trip a week, roughly 10 miles, um, maybe two trips a week, then we would actually reduce our energy consumption in the transportation sector by about 5%, which would be the equivalent of taking 5% of the cars off the road, which would be significant. It would be about 10 million cars. So little things like that we need to identify and need to also understand what is the nudge, if you will, in, in um, Cass Sunstein language of nudging individuals to change the behavior a little bit so that we all can save energy. So energy efficiency, zero carbon transportation, and then recognizing that the US has the highest number of known coal reserves in the world. How do we utilize coal as a resource, but do it in a way that is environmentally friendly? So it's carbon capture and storage or reuse. We estimate that plastics probably use about 15, would prevent um, if we use CO2 in the plastic formation, we could probably save 50 million tons of CO2. That may sound like a lot. <laughs> when you're emitting 6 billion tons, it's a little bit less than a percent. However, if we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which we will, then 50 million tons becomes a lot appreciable percentage of a billion tons. It becomes 5%. And once you pick up little 5%, whether it's cement or plastics or storage or talc or, or uh, paper pulp, you can actually get a good percentage that you can store and reuse. So that is another strategy that we have, carbon capture and storage or reuse uh, sequestration. I think so those would be the big challenges. How do we capture energy efficiency? We talk about that being um, one of the challenges is I know myself that changes I've made do save me energy. But one thing that uh, Cass Sunstein pointed out in the book, Nudge, is that if you have the ability to save 50 pounds, um, or 50 euros, shall we say, a month, so that might be 500 euro over the year, you're less likely to do that than if someone were to say, if you don't do these things, I'm gonna take 500 euro from your bank account. So equivalently, it's the same economics. It's just the way in which the behavior kind of comes in, that we value something that we have more than something that we don't have. So that's one area to, that we really need to focus on as well in the energy efficiency. Lastly, it's a workforce. We were talking about the need um, earlier for a workforce. About half of our energy workforce will be eligible to retire in the next five to 10 years in the US. And currently, we're only graduating about 4.4% of our graduates as engineers. So we'll have a tremendous workforce challenge. Who will be the engineers that innovate, and how will they do that? So it leads to many partnerships. I was an academic here at Trinity College when I wasn't on the pitch. 
I did teach and I did do research, and I think there's uh, some of the best students uh, I've ever taught were at Trinity, and I recruited some of them to come over to the U.S. to work on PhD. They've since come back. Uh, I think that there are great ways that our great universities could do even more together collaboratively. I think partnerships in how we finance energy efficiency projects and what we can learn from each other. And in some sense, I think about um, Ireland is such a, a great, uh, we learn so much from Ireland and what we can do with regard to the grid, what we can do with regard to some of the projects you have, offshore wind, uh, tremendous projects in the North Sea in a collaboration, what we learn about how to do electrification of the transportation sector. So I, th I would hope that we would um, take those partnerships and even make them stronger as we go forward and, and learn from each other on what's the best way to get at some of the issues of how do we decarbonize our electrical sector? How do we uh, capture car CO2? How do we get at the workforce issue? And uh, how do we create storage so that we can store either wind, which is variable, or solar, which uh, also we have in certain parts of the U.S. quite a lot of. I think the challenge going forward is once we know what to do and we know how to do it, it's also going to vary locally. So that's something where, for example, in the U.S., we, we have some geothermal uh, resources. They may not be as large percentage as what we think we uh, can capture from solar and wind, but it's baseload. So it's constant, which is very helpful. And in some areas of the U.S., it's going to be uh, a greater percentage of our local resources. So the next thing that we're working on is with our study and our plan is to map it onto the geographic uh, locations of where the resources are. And then getting those electrons that are generated, say, in the wind in North Dakota to the cities that need them on the East Coast or, or Chicago, uh, we have issues in siting and transmission and, you know, not in my backyard, uh, NIMBY uh, opportunities to overcome and to learn how to do that. So I think the grid is quite interesting. I think the grid is also quite interesting from, and then I'm probably going to conclude with this part of the talk. It's quite interesting from just looking about how living systems distribute resources. If we think about the roots in a tree or the, the um, resources out to the leaves or how we take in food and distribute that to the cells, it's not unlike in some parallel universe, a centralized power station getting power and energy out to all the outlets and all the homes. There's a, there's a natural way to distribute resources, literally a natural organic way of doing that. And I think in the U.S. our grid has just grown organically. It's not really maybe been so much planned. And now we have the opportunity in some places to step back and say, how would we plan it? If we were to plan it, what would be the balancing area so that we can bring on wind with a, a large penetration? And some of the studies we've done that once we're above 33%, uh, you start to have to oscillate your coal-fired plants, your combined cycle plants, even your nuclear power plants in order to follow the, the demand and the load. And that becomes a very difficult proposition without having a smart grid. So we're quite interested in how we exploit the smart grid to give customers information, do demand uh, response type allocation of the electrons within a home, and then finally take advantage of you know, dynamic pricing. So I think that what I hopefully have talked a bit about is that we have similar challenges. We have a challenge of the amount of primary energy we import. We have similar challenges of our human resources of training uh, the next generation for this energy challenge. We are looking at exploiting some of the new renewable resources together. And I, I think that that partnership will do well in the future as we go forward to learn from each other and to continue to promote the clean energy economy. So I just wanted to start out with a, a few words to uh, tee up some question and answer. And I want to thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to the, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.